a very warm welcome to all the participants who have uh, joined us today for this uh, very uh, important session that talks about uh, how the uh, the national biodiversity act especially from the indian perspective is uh, restrictive to submission of taxa for the description of uh, uh, novel taxa to outside culture collections our speaker today is uh, is an amazing person who's been uh, uh, you know working in this field for over 30 years and uh, from india he's been at the forefront of uh, working towards uh, resolving the problems that are associated or i wouldn't call them problems these are conflicts that are associated uh, because of the national biodiversity act and the problems that microbiologists face uh, in describing new taxa, especially the ones that are originating from, uh, from India. So a brief introduction about uh, Professor uh, Dr. Yogesh Shauche. Uh, so Dr. Yogesh Shauche is currently working as a professor at the School of Arts and Sciences at Azim Premji University in Bengaluru, India. He started his career as a scientist at the National Center for Cell Science in Pune, India. And after working on different aspects of microbial life, especially bacterial diversity of various ecological niches, his thrust area of research is now to understand succession of microbial communities in the human gut, and especially during the development uh, of early life and their role in health and disease. He is working since 25 years in the field of microbial ecology, molecular taxonomy, biodiversity. He's published more than 400 publications uh, in journals of relevant areas. He's reviewed publications in the international journals like uh, FEMS Ecology, IJSEM, and Microbial Ecology. He's also on the editorial board of journals like Current Science Plus One, and he's a fellow of the Indian National Science Academy, the National Science Academy of uh, the National Academy of Sciences of India, and Maharashtra Academy of Sciences. In 2009, he was given a responsibility to establish the Microbial Culture Collection, which was known as MCC uh, during those days. Currently, it is known as the National Center for Microbial Resource, and it currently holds over 150,000 bacteria and fungi in its collection, and it's recognized by the WFCC. MCC is also recognized by the IDA, or the International Depository Authority, and it is a designated repository by the Ministry of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change by, of the Government of India under the Biological Diversity Act 2002. In 2018, the Department of Biotechnology extended the mandate of this repository to include antimicrobial resistant microbes. Dr. Sauche, after a successful career at MCCS for 32 years, he has joined Azim Premji University from 1st of March, 2022. He is associated with the SCAN Trust as an advisor. He is also in, uh, on the member of the executive board of the uh, International Society for Systematics of Prokaryotes, that's the ICSP, and also the WFCC. And as a recognition for his contributions to the field of microbial systematics, recently a genus has been named in his honor. So uh, with this uh, brief introduction, I would like to invite uh, Professor Dr. Yogesh Sauche to start his uh, talk, and uh, we can take the question answer sessions uh, at the end of this session. Thank you very much, Kamlesh, for this opportunity. And uh, from the introduction that uh, you gave, uh, BISMIS is uh, the, just the right forum to uh, say what I'm going to say today because uh, since BISMIS is a forum, uh, a global forum for microbial taxonomists, uh, uh, no other forum would have been better to say what I'm going to uh, say today. So I'm very pleased to have this uh, uh, talk today uh, amongst the amongst this group and I hope that uh, this will at least uh, lead to some kind of sensitization about the uh, global researchers about the problem that uh, some countries in the world are facing in terms of uh, describing new taxa. So at the onset, I would like to emphasize that uh, the talk of this presentation is not to blame or criticize 
any entity so uh, do not take anything which i say during the my talk to uh, square the blame on a particular entity so i am just going to present the facts as they are or rather as i understand them there could be some problem with my understanding of the facts also and if somebody feels that they can point it out so i am going to present the facts as i understand them and my major aim is to generate overall awareness about the issues that uh, some of us feel and uh, with the hope that uh, this will lead to some discussions among amongst the concerned persons and eventually arrive at a solution which would be kind of a win win situation which will be a globally acceptable solution otherwise i do not see any headway in finding the solution so if we uh, look at the uh, the excitement of microbial diversity uh, we all know that the microbes are most common and uh, numerous so there exists a tremendous variety of microbes across the globe and the number is phenomenally large total number of microbes and uh, if you look and uh, they they have very important roles to play in uh, all aspects of life so understanding the microbes is uh, very very crucial and uh, we all know uh, about the problems associated with uh, identification of microbes the limitations of culture based methods and all that however even with the limitations of culture based methods also a uh, uh, large amount of prokaryotic diversity exists and this is a little older article so this just estimates the number of prokaryotic species in some of the important environment may it be continental shelf coastal plains and soil so there exists and 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 different soils rain forest seasonal forest uh, uh, lands grazers scrubs they they all contain a huge diversity of microbes the numbers are variable but uh, they contain a huge diversity of microbes and a, a very small fraction of this diversity is characterized in terms of genera and species so if we look at the census of uh, number of microbial species that are described uh, it is estimated that there are around 30000 microbial species that are described so far and this value i have taken for from this article which was published in 2005 so an estimated number of microbial species on the earth is in the tune of some trillions so you realize that a very small fraction of species are described despite the limitations of culture based methods still a large number of species uh, remain undescribed and uh, they are constantly being newer and newer species and taxa are being described because if we look at the journal international journal of systematic evolutionary microbiology you would realize that few thousand new taxa are described every year so the process is going on people are uh, describing new taxa and uh, there are certain rules about the description of novel taxa and one of the important rule is the deposition of culture in a culture collection uh, this is because to uh, uh, ensure the reproducibility of the result and also for the accessibility of this culture for any other researcher for comparison purposes because may, uh, most of the descriptions of new taxa involve comparison with existing taxa and for that purpose the availability of the culture to any researcher in any part of the world for comparison purpose is absolutely essential and this purpose is served by deposition of a culture in a recognized culture collection so that uh, any researcher uh, can 
have access to the culture from anywhere so for that reason then the culture collections become very very important so now if we look at the whole issue there are three players in the issue uh, one is the researcher who wants to describe novel taxa then second player is the national biodiversity laws and i'll i'll come to in few minutes i'll i'll come uh, to the point as to why these laws are important and the background of those laws and the third player is the regulations of prokaryotic nomenclature so these are the three main components of the whole issue and uh, keeping aside researcher researcher i'll i'll, I'll come to it uh, towards the end of the talk because we are all researchers so uh, i need to uh, don't need to give any background for the researcher because the role of researcher i have already specified earlier stating that uh, a large number of uh, taxa are yet to be described and uh, that's the role of the researcher that uh, researcher wants to develop new taxa and uh, uh, he gets his name kind of immortalized because uh, it will always uh, several years down the line it will be always remembered as this particular genus or species is described by this particular researcher and he also gets an opportunity to name this new taxon uh, uh, as per his own ideas of course there are some rules about uh, which names could be given and could not be given but then he has this freedom to choose the name which he wants to give so researcher is a uh, very important player but the his activities are regulated by national biodiversity laws of each country and the uh, regulations of prokaryotic nomenclature and it is this conflict is something which is going to be the uh, point of our discussion today so as i said that the rules for prokaryotic nomenclature are there there are rules for prokaryotic nomenclature so though the researcher has the freedom to uh, decide which name he wants to give so there are many rules uh, for the prokaryotic nomenclature it's a very well organized science dates back to almost 100 years and when we are talking about nomenclature i am not going to talk about the scientific part of it in the sense that uh, what it needs to describe a new species what criteria i am not going to talk about that i am just going to talk about uh, regulatory aspects of that so the nomenclature of prokaryotes is a very well coordinated and organized science and uh, there are very set rules for the nomenclature of prokaryotes how it should be named what are the restrictions for naming and all those so but again those rules are not going to be part of our discussion today uh, we are going to talk only about the uh, issues related to biodiversity act but just to give you a little info i mean little background about uh, this particular society so the these rules are governed by international committee on systematics of prokaryotes so it actually came into existence around 100 years ago the first uh, i mean uh, uh, rules came into picture in 1936 so it is that old and society it's a committee under the bacteriology and Ap applied microbiology division of international union of microbiological societies which is abbreviated as iums and the members for this society come from the members of iums so each country which has uh, uh, which has representation on iums they nominate a nominee to icsp so that's how it works so uh, typically the national microbiological societies of each country become members of iums and then they nominate from their society they nominate a person to represent uh, their country on 
by csp so that is how in general it works there could be some variation some countries do not have microbiology society so some other society becomes member of iums and they nominate the member and then from amongst the members of uh, uh, icsp uh, different committees are formed which include executive board of the uh, icsp and there are also many other committees uh, judicial committees sub committees which look after the issues related to taxonomy of a particular group of prokaryotes so and then their recommendations are uh, made uh, uh, made use of in framing the rules for taxonomy of that particular group of organisms so this is in general uh, how icsp works in some cases uh, icsp also co-opts the member so for some example if some country do not at all have any society which is a member of iums then the uh, some person is co-opted on uh, icsp for this purpose so the major role of uh, icsp when it comes to prokaryotic uh, nomenclature is it determines the rule for prokaryotic nomenclature so time to time depending on how the science evolved the rules are changed and those rules are notified on the society's website inviting comments from other researchers and then finally uh, after taking into consideration uh, comments from everybody the rules are then uh, i mean though they are voted by icsp members and then executive body and then finally th those rules are converted into uh, international code for nomenclature of prokaryotes which as i said keep, it keeps on getting modified uh, frequently depending on the requirement and icsp also runs the i mean it is it supervises the publication of journal international journal of systemic and evolutionary microbiology which i am sure everybody in this crowd knows about this journal and it is a key journal for publishing novel microbial taxa so if the novel taxon is published in ijscm it becomes immediately a valid taxon but many times the researchers don't publish it in uh, ijscm they published in some other journals but the novel taxon is not valid until and unless it is validated at least by publication in the list that ijscm publishes every year so uh, every year ijscm uh, looks at the new taxa published in other journals and if they fulfill the criteria of uh, uh, nomenclature then those are included in the list and then only that uh, newly described taxon gets validated so the if the taxon is published in some other journal but not validated in ijscm it doesn't become a valid new taxa so this is a point to remember and which has a uh, implications on what i am going to talk next so again i'll emphasize that the any new taxon published in any other journal does not become valid until and unless it is published at least in the list that is published by ijscm uh, so this is what the about icsp and icnp and it has several rules but the rule that is most relevant to our discussion is that uh, uh, in 2001 the, uh, uh, the the rule was made that the a uh, newly described uh, when you are describing a new taxon the type culture of that particular taxon has to be deposited in two publicly accessible culture collections in different countries from which subcultures must be available so here the idea was that of course the one deposit will be in the parent country the culture collection of the parent country and one more deposit in some other country to for the easy access there was nothing more to that uh, than this so this is one rule that which uh, necessitates that by describing a new taxon the culture must be deposited in 
two culture collections in two different countries so uh, and the another part of that rule is that the organism deposited in such a fashion that access is restricted such as safe deposit or strain deposited solely for current patent purposes may not serve as a type strain so it is essential that the such a type strain deposited in a culture collection should be available for free distribution so this point regarding the free distribution of cultures interpretation of this point is what is the subject of uh, ongoing problems because uh, uh, the stand which is taken by either ijcm or icnp or icsp is that the any culture which has certain restrictions on its distribution is not valid deposit and uh, patent deposits is one extreme because the patented cultures are not freely accessible to anybody so that is fair enough that the uh, cultures which are deposited or patent purpose are uh, not valid i mean not acceptable as uh, deposition for taxonomic purposes but as we shall see later i'll i'll revisit this point again but i mean i'll, I'll just introduce this point that um, uh, it it also the uh, the rule is also interpreted to mean that any other uh, uh, other form of restriction uh, leave also as a safe deposit but any other form of restriction where some other documentation or uh, approval of some other entity is required uh, that also is regarded as restricted distribution so and that this particular point of approval of any other authority this particular condition is derived from uh, the cbd convention on biological diversity and uh, the nagoya protocol and the legislations which different countries have introduced in response to that so let us try to understand what uh, 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 the I'll, I'll revisit this rule once again okay or i'll, I'll mention it right away so uh, th this rule i have already mentioned uh, i have i've just i'm just highlighting it here so that the uh, with uh, which are the deposit which has any restrictions associated with it does not serve as a type strain for describing new taxa so culture collections are crucial part because uh, the cultures are to be deposited in a culture collection so the requirements for culture collection is that it should have a permanent facility it should have sufficient infrastructure for maintenance and preservation of the strain and it should have expertise in relevant areas and uh, there are various culture collections across the globe personal departmental some specialized culture collections service culture collections and then the role of culture collections is supply identification and related service so the culture collections that we are talking about are the uh, culture collections which are uh, which have their cultures with them in general and open access deposits so these are the culture collections which are the ones where the deposits are to be made for taxonomic purposes so uh, this pro uh, proposed change I'll, I'll i'll revisit this proposed change uh, on the later let us go to now cbd so the uh, whatever i said about prior approval for accessing the strain or depositing the strain all these have come because of the how cbd has evolved and how it has been interpreted over the years so convention of Bi uh, biological diversity it came into force way back in 1993 it has 150 signatories and its major objective is conservation of biological diversity sustainable use of the components of biological diversity and the objective which is of our concern today is to ensure fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising out of the utilization of genetic resources so this is one of the 
main objectives of convention on biological diversity so in order to achieve fair and equitable sharing of the benefits the article 15 uh, said that it recognizes the sovereign rights of the states over their natural resources and their authority to determine access to genetic sources rests with the national governments and its subject national legislation. So CBD has given the uh, states choice to design national legislations to regulate the access of their genetic resources. And it has also said that it each contracting party shall endeavor to create conditions to facilitate access to genetic resources for environmentally sound use by other contracting parties and not to impose restrictions that run counter to the objectives of the convention. So on one side, it says that the state has rights to uh, uh, control regulation to their uh, control access to their natural resources. But at the same time, it also says that it should generate an environment such that the other parties of the treaty also have access to these uh, resources with proper precautions. So this is what the Article 15 of CBD says. So in order to implement, implement these provisions of uh, CBD, uh, subsequently Nagoya Protocol came into existence in uh, 2010. And uh, uh, so it, it, it kind of lays, lays down the framework for fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from the utilization of genetic resources by contributing the convention and sustainable use of biodiversity. So talking about its impact on cultural collection, again, that is not the topic of today's discussion, but talking about impact of uh, uh, implementation of Nagoya protocol, most culture collections in the world, especially the ones like uh, DSMZ, they have changed many of their documentation procedures and they have made certain declarations in terms of uh, 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 the abiding to national laws. They have made compliance to these regulations mandatory by depositing the cultures in uh, the culture collection. Uh, whether it is for taxonomic purpose or non-taxonomic purpose is irrelevant, but uh, they have changed the documentation procedures for the deposition of cultures and they mandate that the uh, whenever the culture is uh, deposited in the culture collection, the compliance with the national laws of that particular country is mandatory. So unless compliance to national laws of the country is uh, uh, assured, the cultures are not accepted. So, uh, so the, I mean, that's so many, uh, as I said, that many culture collections have made changes in their procedures to respect the provisions of uh, Nagoya protocol uh, and the process is slowly evolving. So it's, it's a very complicated procedure as we shall see later, the process is slowly evolving. So today what happens is that uh, because of uh, this on one side, the requirement of uh, unrestricted access for taxonomic, uh, uh, for description of new taxa, uh, a requirement from ICNP that the cultures, any culture which is uh, a type strain for a new taxon should be a restriction free. The access to that culture should, should, be, should not be restricted by uh, any prior approval. So, uh, this this stand on one side. On the other stand, the regulations made by some of the contracting parties of CBD to protect their natural uh, resources is on the other hand. And uh, the currently the this heat is being faced by three major countries: India, South Africa, and Brazil, because they were made their national biodiversity laws 
quite early in advance. Uh, many countries have not yet made the laws and the mechanism to implement the CBD. It is slowly evolving and as and how those countries are making provisions, uh, more and more countries are entering into problem zone for description of uh, uh, new taxa. It is also important to understand one more point here is that much of this problem arises, and it is a universal problem not restricted to these countries that the microbial resources are treated at par with sources like plant and animals and uh, other uh, resources without understanding the fact that uh, majority of microbes are uncultured, point number one. And secondly, there is no proven endemism in microbes. Professor Overman uh, some time back had written one article where he said that everything is found everywhere. So something which is, uh, uh, there is no microbe probably uh, which is uh, totally endemic to a particular country, uh, the same genera and species in this, uh, comparable environment are uh, can be found globally for whatever reasons. So if you don't find uh, that microbe in your country, I mean, if you cannot describe that particular microbe from your country, somebody else from some other country would describe that. So uh, the endemism for microbes is uh, uh, not proven. So that is a, and, but the, for most countries, their regulations do not recognize this fact and general laws which are applied to plant and animal resources are applied to microbes also. But currently, these three countries are facing problems. Uh, but uh, I would not, I, I, at the end, I'll summarize the issue for South Africa and Brazil. But I'll talk more about uh, problems in India because uh, I am more familiar with the problems in India. So the again, it goes back to CBD. The CBD, as I said, that PB, CBD provides sovereign rights uh, to countries over their biological resources and it, uh, it uh, recommends, recommends that countries should facilitate access to genetic resources by their uh, uh, by other parties using national legislation and mutually agreed terms so it it, it so uh, it, it requires that the each country makes a legislation uh, for restricting uh, the access to biological resources. And then it should provide equitable sharing of benefits arising for the utilization. And finally, as I said, that it has made necessary for a leg legislation to put in place, which for each country should make a legislation which lays down the framework for providing access, for determining the terms and conditions of such access, and ensure equity, equitable sharing of the benefits. So in order to achieve these goals, uh, each state was required to make a legislation. And as I said earlier that uh, Brazil, India, and South uh, Africa, they made these legislations quite early. So in India, the legislation was made in uh, made 20 years back. In 2022, the Biodiversity Act was, uh, passed and under the Biodiversity Act, the National Biodiversity Authority was established in 2003 and this National Biodiversity Authority was a, a central single point or a body that was formed to regulate the access of biological resources in the country to everybody. So it regulates the access of biological resources in India to Indians as well as biological resources for non-Indians. So and uh, so this authority was formed. It has uh, uh, with head office in Chennai and uh, uh, organizational structure. I will not get into the details of organizational structure because it is not relevant for uh, our discussions today. But uh, this body came into existence, and it, it, uh, as I said, that it it 
regulates the by making guidelines regulates the access of to biological resources with fair and equitable benefit sharing so that is the purpose for which the this particular uh, body was established and the it also made then rules for regulation of access of biological diversity and uh, the rules which are relevant for our discussion is only one rule uh, rule number 3 so it, it it in i mean i'll not get into technical language of this rule but um, what it says is that the any indian accessing biological resources within india uh the permissions are not required i mean either from the national body or the state body the permissions are not required if the biological resources is being accessed purely for research purpose however a person who is not an indian who is not a citizen of india for that person the permission from national body is required and this non indian person includes obviously non indians by birth and also non indians who have acquired citizenship for other countries or who are staying outside india for a longer period so there are again some sub rules to define that i'll not get into those complications but any person which is not an indian citizen has to take prior permission before accessing biological resources in the country and for the sake of our discussion now it is translated into any organization accessing a culture that has been originated in india for any purpose for research purpose taxonomic comparison purpose becomes a non indian entity and the law obviously does not distinguish between a individual researcher or Uh, organization like culture collection so culture collections outside india are also regarded as uh, non indian entities and the same rules regulate the access or deposit of indian origin cultures in these collections so that is the conflict between uh, now the biodiversity act of india and the regulations of uh, icmp so what it translated uh, 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 what it translated into is there are many ramifications of that one ramification of course is uh, any non indian accessing indian origin culture whether from culture collections on indian soil or the culture collections somewhere outside india has to take prior permission of national biodiversity authority before accessing the culture not only that any indian uh, uh, sometime back I, i just showed the rule for uh, culture deposition from icmp that it requires deposition in two culture collections one in your own country and one in some other country so even a indian researcher who wants to deposit his culture for taxonomic purposes in some other culture collection he also has to take prior permission from national biodiversity authority to deposit the culture and i'll, I'll again we will we are going to revisit this point sometime later so uh and obviously uh, uh culture collection on indian soil if some uh, researcher makes a demand for culture collection that culture collection they have to go to biodiversity authority not only that if the indian origin culture is available in some other culture collection outside india even that culture collection is by this law if that culture collection even that culture collection is first required to seek permission from national biodiversity authority if request for that culture is received by the culture collection so it it creates a 
very complicated situation and that's where is the bone of contention so with that the biodiversity authority also came up with a procedure to regulate the access to biological resources so i'll again not go into the details of uh, all this procedure uh, the applicant there is an online form which uh, applicant has to fill in the pay the fees then nba will approve all the approve that internally uh, scrutinize these that and all and finally give approval uh, uh, it, it is not relevant for today's discussion uh, I, i will not go into the details of this but that's how the procedure is and uh, this led to uh, this has been happening for almost a decade this has led to rejection of uh, uh, papers describing new taxa from many indian researchers because the cultures deposited that time the interpretation was cultures deposited in any culture collection on indian soil are not free for distribution so there was a higher media where uh, people deposited cultures in uh, some other countries but then that also got into problem because it is a violation of uh, biodiversity law because the researcher had not taken prior permission from biodiversity authority so many papers were rejected i will not get into again details of that so this i have already highlighted this problem in in my discussion that uh, the researcher from outside india needs to take prior nba permission the procedure is longer fees are higher and uh, so uh, in general no indian culture uh, culture is available for free distribution uh, whichever country it has been deposited so uh after all this issue uh of course the repositories had a problem because uh, uh even though they have the type culture they cannot distribute to, uh, to anybody without that person seeking nba approval so the finally the after much persuasion national biodiversity authority introduced this particular form where they allowed indian researcher to deposit the culture just by filling up this form so no prior permission was required just by filling up this form indian researcher could deposit the culture in any culture collection uh, for the taxonomic purpose however this did not solve the problem because the issue here was that the culture collection where this culture is deposited that was expected to abide by indian regulations so in other words means that even if a researcher fills up uses form c deposit the cultures in uh, any culture collection outside indian soil that culture collection when a request is received for that particular culture has to come to national biodiversity authority for permission and most culture collections when they realize that they interpreted this as restricted distribution and refused to accept the cultures from india for taxonomic purposes so uh, that's how the finally uh, the situation is created that the deposits in culture collection on indian soil are not acceptable deposits made abroad obviously are not acceptable but even the culture collections are now refusing to accept the cultures from indian researchers so that's where the situation stands now so there are umpteen number of examples where deposits for taxonomic purpose where uh, purposes were refused by many culture collections uh, for this reason and the requirement of uh, deposition of culture in two culture collections cannot be made and of course then the manuscript cannot be published so this has resulted in decline in number of taxonomic uh, publications from india so likewise i'll uh, uh, I'll, i'll quickly i'll come to the situation in other countries also so as i said that brazil and south africa also have uh, similar uh, problems so brazil's law was uh, modified in 20 uh, in 2021 but still it has not helped so the legislation came into existence in uh 20 uh, modified legislation came into existence in 2021 and uh, so i mean uh, uh, the authority to control the access is in india it is national biodiversity authority 
in case of south africa it is department of forestry fisheries and environment uh, in case of brazil it is genetic heritage management council so uh, brazil has made the registration of any user to this authority system mandatory and was the user is registered here then no subsequent permission is required but the caveat here is that the the user must have a collaborator from brazil that is mandatory so uh, that's where the brazil has problem and then i mean there are various uh, uh, issues related to scope of the law then uh, the the permissions required for the exporting the strain here i have already said that india has a form c but which is practically of uh, no use in case of south africa only south african citizens or permanent residents can apply directly or export permits required for the export of indigenous biological resources any foreign national needs to jointly apply with south african person so the foreign research the research the non south african researcher cannot individually access uh, these uh, resources in case of uh, brazil it is the shipment must be recorded in sigen uh, system it has to be accompanied with a mta and uh, uh, so when we are talking about access to genetic resources i have already said that in india it is restricted to any non indian and uh, uh, in case of south africa the indigenous biological resources cannot be sold donated or transferred to a third party without written consent by the issuing authority so all these three countries the provisions of their biodiversity act are interpreted by uh, icnp icsp as restricted distribution and the publications are not accepted for the taxonomic purpose so here i have summarized the situation this is from our own publication in tiptech we have published a paper recently in tiptech this is a, uh, this is a summary of that so regulations if you look at the south africa mta is not required but approval by the competent authority required national partner required when you talk about india the national partner is not required but approval from competent authority and mta is required so any foreign researcher can access the resources without having the need for a local partner as against that brazil and south africa require local partners same in brazil the approval is not required once you are registered in sigen and you have a, na a national partner and mta is also required so this is a summary of the uh what the situation is currently with respect to these three countries so this is a kind of a stalemate and what we feel is required is that uh, as the time progresses many more countries will come up with different versions of uh, their biodiversity regulation act oh so a single solution would not suffice because there will be many versions of restrictions and one needs to come up with a solution uh, uh, i mean the country by country solutions are going to be difficult because each country will have its own version so finding a specific solution is very difficult there has to be there is a need to develop a uniform inclusive and globally acceptable solution and there are many various mechanisms discuss for that including a open access database to monitor the movement of cultures so uh, this is what i had to say about the issue i hope i have been able to make make my point and thank you very much for your attention so now we have we can have some discussion thank you dr yogesh uh, that was really informative um we have received some questions if you are ready i uh, if you are ready to take them yeah yeah sure sure yeah your uh, video is uh, apparently turned off somehow yeah yeah no okay. i had put off the video for bandwidth okay. yeah um so we have received some uh, actually comments these are uh, so one very uh, 
obvious question is uh, would someone be a smuggler to arrange deporting microbes out of the country say in soil like it was done for penicillin notatum in the backdrop of the world war 1 how would uh, you know these uh, these rules are anyways uh, foregone for those instances so how can obviously, one control yeah obviously yeah. i mean uh, 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 that's where is the problem with the rules uh, that uh, it is very difficult to monitor the transfer uh, transfer of bio uh, i mean the movement of biological resources uh, there is no monitoring mechanism also if somebody picks up a handful of soil there is no monitoring mechanism at the airports to uh, detect that and uh, stop the person even for that matter uh, if your shoes the uh, the soil could also be attached to your shoes and if you go there how are you going to monitor that somebody can take a swab from the shoe and uh, isolate the organisms and worst scenario is uh, about the human body associated microbes uh, if the person goes travels to some other country uh, and gives his sample skin sample oral sample or uh, fecal sample for gut microbiome you cannot say that the after going uh, to some other country you should not use the toilets there and all that i mean this is ridiculous i mean according to me this is ridiculous to go into okay. this extent yeah um the next one is uh, it's it's more of a microbiology question uh, for the culture collection perspective how long a microbial culture collection maintains its purity through subculturing cycle so i think the question is more related to in how many or what is the frequency of subculturing at microbial culture collection see it, it depends from organism to organism typically in a culture collection the cultures are preserved in uh, in addition to life lesson they are also preserved in liquid nitrogen and studies have shown that in liquid nitrogen the viability is uh, uh, it's infinite but as far as life less cultures the uh, different taxa have different uh, viability and uh, Now, typically, a culture collection monitors the viability at periodic intervals, and when the viability goes down beyond below a threshold level, they make a fresh stock. All right, right. Um, I'm going to ask a very specific question, which is my own. What is the latest stand of NBA on on this issue? Are they working towards resolving this, or are they still? thinking from the zoological and the botanical perspective and restricting microbes in the same manner see uh, uh, nba stand keeps on uh, uh, it's variable it it keeps on varying time to time at one point of time they had kind of accept uh, agreeable to a uh, workable solution that uh, we had come with but then at the last moment they went back foot and uh, uh, see the point is that a uh, couple of times we had made attempts with icsp ijcm uh, icsp uh, or and all to arrive at a amicable solution but uh, if both the parties sh somebody should take a, a foot forward somebody should go a foot backward so uh, nba stand unfortunately keeps on varying okay okay um there's a question from uh, mutsaki suzuki the question is at cop 15 it was decided that mechanism of multilateral system of digital sequence information will be settled until cop 16 so will the multilateral system also help or not for the issue of culture collection we personally believe that a multilateral solution will help to uh, resolve this issue but the problem is that uh, uh, you know it affects such a minor community globally also that uh, this issue is never discussed i mean uh, even uh, in, in, in amongst the microbiology community also the microbial taxonomy uh, number is uh, very 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 small and that's the reason this uh, issue at at no forum the issue is taken up on priority basis that's the biggest problem okay okay um raul resco has a comment he says that at least in european countries uh, it is not that they 
have not enforced uh, or developed the Nagoya protocol. They actually enforce it, but they have clauses for the description of biodiversity. Yeah. So uh, is, is that something that the NBA is uh, possibly looking at that we can have clauses within the Biodiversity Act to describe biodiversity for uh, research purposes? See, the present, uh, the present uh, uh, version of the Biodiversity Act does not distinguish research and com commercial use. So right. uh, in the amendment to the act, there were attempts to make this distinction, but the document was prepared three years back on war footing, but I do not think it has yet come, it's tabled in the parliament. Okay, okay. So basically, it's just uh, put it on the side desk. Let's see when there is a, a hue and cry about it. We'll take it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Srinivas Krishnamurti has a question. Which microbiology organization in India nominates members to the ICSP? So, uh, till very recently, AMI was not registered with IUMS. The only uh, this thing that was registered with IUMS was uh, uh, Indian Academy of Science. And uh, uh, but that also, when I contacted them last, uh, uh, that was some three, four years back, uh, uh, the issue also was uh, <laughs> uh, Academy had not paid the uh, membership fees to IUMS. So that was in a limit. Yeah, but now I understand AMI has also become member of uh, uh, IUMS, so probably okay. AMI can nominate a person to uh, uh, IUMS. Yeah, so to answer Srini's question, uh, the uh, all the members, all societies that pay their annual dues to the IUMS can actually nominate a single individual per society to become a member of the ICSP. So that's how uh, this uh, this works. So the Burgess International Society also has a membership with the IUMS, and we do have our designated member who attends, uh, you know, ICSP and uh, is a is a part of that. Um, I think with this, uh, Professor Sauche, we have completed all the questions. Okay. Um, yeah, so we are right on time for you to go for your thank next you. appointment. Thank you, thank yeah. you, thank you. Uh, before we close, I would like to thank you personally for uh, accepting accepting this invitation on a very short notice. And uh, for our audience, uh, we have the next session will be by um, Professor Henrik Christensen uh, from University of Copenhagen, Denmark. The session will be on Saturday the 15th at the same time, and the topic will be synonyms and stability of names. This topic will specifically touch the aspect of how change in the names and nomenclature of a particular uh, taxa has an impact on the clinical diagnostics, on the research arena, and how it has been uh, you know, stable over the years, uh, leaving aside a few uh, taxonomic changes. So with this, I'll close. I thank Dr. Yogesh Sauche and uh, all the participants who have uh, joined us for this uh, very important session. Thank you so much. And thank we'll you see very you much. In the next Thanks. Session. Thanks a lot. Bye. -bye.